Welcome back. Um, now that was a quick lesson in how to construct good test questions. And now we're going to use our same clinical problem solving schools to teach you how to answer questions effectively. Here's a sample question. You remember Mr. Durrett, we've seen him before. Mr. Durrett is not having a good week. He's an 85 year old man who's four days post-operative after an aortic valve replacement. Yesterday, he was started on solumedrol for polyarticular pseudogout. Today, he has been confused and climbing out of bed. He was fine at lunch, and when his wife came to see him, he was hard to arouse. An hour later, the cross-cover intern examined him and found him to be awake, but anxious and complaining that people were out to get him. His physical exam was notable for a temperature of 100, a heart rate of 110, a blood pressure of 180 over 90. He is anxious and combative. A clean, dry sternotomy wound is present. Lungs are clear. Heart sounds are normal. Abdomen is soft and non-tender. And there's a small amount of edema in the lower legs and sacral area. His finger stick glucose is 350 milligrams per deciliter. And pulse oximetry is 98% on two liters. So let's make a diagnosis. Uh, from the information you have now, what is the most likely diagnosis? One, dementia. Two, acute bacterial meningitis. Three, delirium. Four, schizophrenia. Or five, agitated depression. Choose your answer. Okay, let's analyze this question. So doing well on tests uses the same approach as we have practiced. You develop and process a problem list for this patient, you construct a patient illness script, and then you match it to the disease illness scripts of the possible answers, or the disease illness scripts that are linked to the possible answers if the answers are given in terms of treatment. I want you to note in this history um, what elements of it are unprocessed, because sometimes when um, a question is given to you, um, they deliberately don't process the key elements of the, of the case. And so, for instance, instead of saying he was stuporous yesterday, they said he was hard to arouse. Instead of saying that he was hard to arouse then um, and that his mental status was waxing and waning, they actually described that for you. An hour later, the cross cover intern examined him and found him to be anxious and complaining that people are out to get him. Again, saying that he's uh, a description of paranoia without processing it to paranoia. So here's Mr. Durrett's illness script for this particular component of his um, hospitalization, and we know he's had several issues along the way. Epidemiology, this is a post-operative elderly male with a metabolic derangement. Interestingly, right, we put metabolic derangement in epidemiology because we think it might be list, uh, we might be linked, and it's a new problem, right? It's new to the scenario here. He didn't have problems with diabetes on previous visits. The time course of his um, current presentation is acute. He was fine yesterday, and it's been waxing and waning. Um, so he was, oh, he was stuporous, and then he was paranoid, and then he was agitated. And the syndrome statement, low-grade fever, confusion, agitation, anxiety, and delusions following steroid initiation. And his known history of hypertension and aortic stenosis. So that's his illness script. So let's evaluate the distractors that are present um, as part of the answers. One was dementia. Now, he can't do several serial sevens and was disoriented, but the time course for this was way too quick, so dementia seems unlikely to be the right answer. Bacterial men meningitis was one of the um, possible answers. And of course, we'd be concerned about that in an elderly man with, a fever, with fever and confusion. But waxing and waning um, are really an unlikely um, time course for bacterial meningitis. People, once they get it, tend to just get steadily worse. They don't get worse and then better, then worse and then better. And it's also not very common for hospitalized patients to get bacterial meningitis unless their spine has been instrumented, like they had surgery on their um, brain or ventricles or spine. And we know that was the case. That wasn't the case with Mr. Durrett. And agitated depression, again, um, this is very acute. He's anxious and combative, and that's why they're trying to um, distract you to that particular diagnosis. But we know that's very um, fast for this to have had its onset within the hospital. It seems pretty unlikely. 
So um, if I was going to prioritize the differential diagnosis for Mr. Durrett, I'd say that tier one is likely to be delirium. Tier three, the agitated depression, because he doesn't even really seem depressed, he's just anxious. Um, tier 1E might be acute bacterial meningitis. I might consider that, although honestly, given um, the absence of other findings related to meningitis, I think the true tier for bacterial meningitis is a tier 3. But um, we've talked about the possibility that you might be a little bit more liberal in considering um, serious bacterial infections that might um, cause death or dis disability overnight if you, if you guess wrong. And tier two might be dementia with delirium, right? Um, so certainly dementia doesn't happen overnight, but maybe he has a little un underlying de dementia and the delirium is making it worse. So um, one of the questions we could ask for this with this clinical stem, instead of what's the likely diagnosis, which we thought was delirium, is instead what therapy is indicated to initiate the management for this particular patient. And this therapy also, um, to answer this question appropriately about therapy, you have to have the right diagnosis, right? So if you chose memantine, you would say, well, I thought the diagnosis was dementia. If you chose vancomycin, ampicillin, and ceftriaxone, you'd say it's bacterial meningitis in the elderly. If you chose chazodone, you'd say, well, I thought the most likely diagnosis was depression. And if you chose stop the steroids and start the insulin, you'd say the most likely diagnosis was delirium. So you can see that that um, compare and contrast thinking around what's the right diagnosis um, is really critical for many of these clinical type questions that you'll face on different exams. So let's uh, do the follow up on Mr. Durrett. Mr. Durrett was seen by neurology and other than his hyperglycemia, his lab tests, including a complete blood count, were totally within normal limits. A CT scan was considered but not obtained because there were no focal findings on his clinical exam. And in order to do the exam, it, to do the CT scan, it was felt that he'd need to be sedated, which would interfere with our ability to follow him longitudinally throughout the hospital course. A diagnosis of delirium related to steroid use and hyperglycemia was made. The steroids were tapered. Glucose was controlled and the patient was monitored and supported by his wife and family with frequent reorientation strategies. The following day, he returned to his premorbid condition and was able to converse normally. So that's the good news for Mr. Durrett um, and the good news for you because now you know how to use your clinical problem solving skills to analyze the questions that you might see on, on tests that you'll take throughout your medical um, or health professions career.